Philippians chapter 2. Have you ever started your day with by, by praying preventative prayers? Now, I know some of you have heard me talk about the importance of preventative prayers, so if you have, bear with me. But preventative prayers are the prayers that you pray when you first wake up in the morning. These are the prayers that you pray even before you have a chance to commit a particular sin. Because all of us have those sins, right, that trip us up. We, we find ourselves having to confess and repent constantly of, of certain things. And, and so preventative prayers is, is instead of the, the normal way of you, you commit the sin, you confess, you repent, um, you kind of flip the script on that a little bit. And you start praying when you get up first thing in the morning, Lord, I know that I have a proclivity to this particular sin. And so I'm asking you before I even get out of bed, before I get up and have an opportunity to sin, will you help me this morning? Will you help me today, throughout the day, to guard against committing that sin in the first place? And that's the idea of preventative prayers, is, is we're trying to prevent the sin before it even happens. Thankfully, we have the ability to confess and repent whenever we do sin so that we can find freedom and forgiveness. But wouldn't it be even better, right? If, if before we, we say that mean thing to that person that then we have to go and undo and confess and repent to them, what if we never said it to them in, in the first place? Right? How, how glorious would that be to be able to have the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit stop us before we even commit that sin? And so that, that's the importance of preventative prayers. It, it helps to kind of flip the script and allow the Holy Spirit to, to help you to, one, be more aware of the sin condition. Right, Just you praying that prayer every morning, Lord, I, I am going to be tempted to commit X. Whatever that is for you in your life, you, you, you ask the Lord to help you to not do that. And just by doing that, the Holy Spirit then prompts you and makes you more aware of when you're about to do that. And the Holy Spirit helps you then to, to fight those life-dominating sins. Preventative prayers are, are also helpful for what Paul is discussing in our passage this morning. Last week we began, Paul began his discussion on the importance of unity. Really kind of the, the thrust of this book is there are two women fighting in the church. There are two women that have some kind of disagreement. And, and he is trying to bring unity into this church and into this situation. He has a lot of great things to say about this church. But the one thing that he is trying to address, and we'll see this more in chapter 4, is the dissension that's happening between two leading women in the church. And this week, Paul is going to continue that discussion on the topic of unity. And he'll, he'll start out our passage this morning by showing us the ultimate example, I think, of unity that you can find in all of the Bible in verses 1 and 2. And then in verses 3 and 4, Paul is going to give us a, a key danger and a key element needed for unity. And then in verses 5 through 11, Paul is going to give us the ultimate example of, of that element that we all need to have if we're going to be unified. So let's get started. We're going to kind of break it up in, in that, uh, that way. So we're going to start in verse 1 of Philippians chapter 2. It says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit... Any affection and sympathy complete my joy by, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now, I know some people have an issue with the word Trinity because they will argue that Trinity is not in the Bible. But the concept of the Trinity, I would argue, is all throughout the New Testament. As God has fully revealed himself to us, he has revealed himself as a Trinitarian God. And I think here in verse 1, Paul is hinting at that Trinity. And just it just kind of shows you just how 
deeply ingrained this idea of a Trinitarian God is to the Apostle Paul, that, that he starts out his discussion on unity by hinting at and drawing our attention to one of the greatest unities in all of the Bible, which is the Trinity. That, that he is three distinct persons, yet one, completely unified together. Paul starts out our passage and finishes our passage with Jesus Christ, right? The second person of the Trinity. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, he says, and then the example that he's going to give us is of Christ at the end of this passage. And then Paul finishes verse 1 with uh, the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Any participation in the Spirit, he says. But notice in the middle there is a reference to love. Now hear me out, and I want to remind you of another passage. We've got to let Scripture interpret Scripture This is another passage about love and unity from 1 John 4, 7 through 15. He says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent His only Son into the world so that He that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. And then he repeats himself, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So I think what you you have here in Philippians chapter 2 is is Paul is arguing for unity, and, and, and he's hinting at the greatest unity that we find in all of Scripture, which is the Trinity. God in three persons, and yet one. And we have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all in this passage as he is laying the the theological framework for why we should be unified. God is love. He is not just loving. He is the definition of love. If you want to understand love, you need to understand God. Because he is the definition of love. And that love is made very clear in 1 John 4. His love is that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies, He sent His Son to die for us so that we might have a way of having that unity, that communion with Him through His gift of Jesus Christ. Not that we loved Him, but that He loved us, His enemies, rebels. And yet He loves us. And so Paul is giving us that little cue there in the beginning of our passage in verse 1. But then he goes on in verse 2 and he says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. I, I love Paul because Paul's not above using emotion to motivate the Philippians, is he? Paul asks of them what? Complete my joy, right? That's about his emotional state. He's trying to get them to do what they need to do to be unified and using his own joy as the motivator to help them with that. Paul knows that that they will want to complete his joy, right? We've already talked about in chapter 1 the the love relationship that this is, Paul says, you're the one people that support me. You're the one church that's always got my back. He knows that they love him. And so Paul invokes that emotion and he wants them to to focus 
their unity so that he might find joy in hearing of their unity. And though Paul doesn't mind invoking their emotions, he doesn't stop with their emotions. He continues in verses 3 through 11 to lay out a logical, uh, theological argument as well. And just as a side it, about Paul's method, it, it's important to take note of that there are, there are some Christians that think everything should be emotionally driven. And there are some Christians that think everything should be purely logical or theologically driven. But Paul reminds us here of both in chapters 1 and 2. And the reality is we need both approaches. If we're going to address the whole person, both logical and emotional, the way God made them, we're going to have to appeal to both. And we need to be careful of not falling into the ditch either way of saying it only has to be one way or the other. We need to address the whole person the way Paul is addressing the whole person here. But Paul then moves on in verse 3 to address a barrier to unity and its solution. In verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Now, these are two of the most dangerous pests that disturb the peace of a church. Selfish ambition and conceit. Selfish ambition arises when someone stubbornly clings to their own opinions. And and once they start clinging to those opinions, they, they tend to distance themselves and isolate themselves from others. Because they think they are right and everyone else is wrong. And then conceit comes along and entices people, making them proud of their own ideas. Like my ideas are really the best. These other people, they don't know what they're doing. I know what I'm doing. And the only way to prevent dissension, to avoid the, the strife, is by deliberately and forcefully acting peacefully. Especially when we are not driven by ambition. Like I... That, that, that's one of the things that you, you see so many times in churches is somebody, I'm, try, I'm trying to get somewhere, I'm trying to go somewhere, I'm trying to be somebody. Instead of serving in God's kingdom, it's all about how do I build my kingdom. Paul tells us that self-ambition, it, it, it just fuels strife. But Paul also says the remedy to these two things is humility. If the thing that creates so much dissension is selfish ambition and conceit, the the remedy, the way to fix that is humility. Both problems, whether it's selfish ambition or conceit, the solution that Paul gives us is humility this morning. Because humility does what? It, it, it leads us to yield our rights and opinions and instead prioritize others. We no longer stop and think that my way is the only way or the right way. We, we can slow down long enough to, to go, you know what, maybe they have a point. Maybe they're seeing something that I'm not seeing. Maybe they've got some experience that I don't have. And that allows you to have a a measure of humility that that enables you to then work with other people. But if it always has to be your way, then there's going to be a danger. There's going to be division that happens within a church. And really within any group of people. You, You guys have... Friend groups that you see this in, right? This is not just churches. This is groups of people, right? You, you may have that one friend that I, they always want to go this place to eat. And they don't really care about what you want. It's about what I want. Well, what happens over time? You stop spending time with that person, right? 
Because they're so forceful, they're so demanding, they're so opinionated. And we need, as Christians, to be humble and show humility. True humility, he explains, is when everyone considers themselves less than others. Pride causes us to to foolishly admire ourselves and to to look down on others. History is full of this, right? History is full of prideful people. You think about somebody like Napoleon's pride. Like he, he... pridefully thought, you know what? I'm going to invade Russia. I'm not smart, but even I know that's not a good idea. (laughs) Took 600,000 soldiers. Surely we can do it with this. Half a million died. Now, I know some of your women are like, yeah, history is full of prideful men that are always costing lives. But in the case of fairness, because I'm all about fairness here, let me remind you of a queen you may have never heard of. Her name was Queen Ranavalova, Ranavalona, sorry. She was queen of Madagascar, and her pride led to the most severe repression and harsh treatment of her subjects. Her reign saw a brutal suppression of Christianity. It was forced labor. When she was done, half of the population had died. Two and a half million people. We struggle as human beings to accept other people as equals, let alone prefer them. History, again, is full of examples of people who thought they knew better. Because they didn't listen to the people around them. They, they had their own ideas and their own pride and their own conceit elevated those ideas to where they thought, I know what's best. And death and destruction always Follow those people. And Paul is arguing to the Philippians, don't be those people. Now, specifically, he's talking to these two women who have some kind of disagreement that we don't know the details about. But I think the same thing is true for each and every one of us here this morning. It's very easy to put your ideas and your ways of doing things above everyone else's ways. And it's hard to, To set yourself aside and and look at someone else and and, and see that maybe, maybe they have a better idea. But that's what Paul is asking these women in Philippi to do. And this church to do. And and Paul is, is, he knows that pride will always kill unity. And so he wants them to be on guard. He wants them to do everything they can do to be attacking that pride. We, we live in a culture that has elevated pride to not a sin, but something to be celebrated. And yet Paul in our passage this morning is clearly saying, this is the one thing that will kill you. This is the one thing that will divide you. And I think his case is made pretty clearly in our culture today. Starting in verse 5, he he gives us something greater. He gives us a a, a greater thing that he's calling us to, and it's the example of Jesus Christ. In verse 5, it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul says, if if we're going to talk about humility, because I I know I know you're going to struggle with humility and well, how far is too far? Paul says, let me give you the ultimate example. Let, Let me give you the example of Jesus Christ, who could have come as a 30-year-old man to this earth. Right? He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But that's not what happened. He, He humbled himself and became a child. A child that someone has to care for. Sometimes it amazes me that the human race continues to exist. 
because of, of just how needy children are, right? How needy babies are and, and how ineffective they are at caring for themselves. They need others. And that's the form in which God sent his son into this world. Because Paul, he he wants us to have this image that we will cultivate this humility in our lives. Let me me just highlight a couple of ways that these verses can can help us to to cultivate humility in our lives. One, we we need to reflect on Jesus' sacrifice and the gospel daily. Right? That, that's what Paul is calling us back to. He, even death on a cross. He, he was that obedient, obedient to the point of death. We need, to re- we need to remember, we need to reflect on Jesus' sacrifice for us. That helps us when we say, but God, this is so hard. <laughs> what you're asking me to do, I have to, I have to keep showing up for these people. I have to keep loving these people even to the point of death. That's what Jesus did. What what if he gave up when you gave up? Second, we need to recognize and appreciate God's grace daily in our life. God's grace is what empowers us. It's what drives us. It's the love that that empowers us to be selfless, to, to be to to help us to serve other people and to think of other people more than ourselves. And that that leads to that, that grace leads to the third thing. We need to be serving others selflessly. One One of the biggest things that I encourage people to do who are struggling with selfishness is start serving somebody else. Just go start helping someone else. One thing that that will do practically, typically, is quickly make you realize how good you have it. Because sitting there by yourself in your house, you can make it out like you got it pretty bad. Until you get out and start talking to some other people. And and that helps you to go, you know what? I need to be thankful for the grace that God has extended to me. There are so many blessings that I have that I'm taking for granted. I make a lot of hospital visits and, and visiting people when they're sick. And one of the common themes that I hear from people is how much they now, because of whatever condition they have, take for granted something that they had never even thought about in their day. I was in the hospital this week visiting with somebody. And he told me, he said, man, he said, the Lord gets me through this. And I go back home. Every time I go to the bathroom, I'm going to praise the Lord. (laughs) Because right now, he's all cut up and things are going 10 different ways. And something that used to be so simple, didn't even give it a thought. He now realizes what he's missing. And and so many times, uh, you, you hear that with... You know, people hurt their back and it's like, you, you don't, you, you just take your back for granted. You're like, it's there. I can get up. I can get down without pain. And then all of a sudden you can't. And you go, man, I remember the good old days <laughs> when I could sleep all night. <laughs> I could sit in a chair for longer than 30 minutes. You know, it's like you, you, you begin to realize, and that's what getting out and talking to others and serving someone else helps to give you that perspective in your life. But the reality is this this will be very difficult if the Lord hasn't changed your heart. Because I I don't want you to hear me with this list going, okay, this is something I need to do. If it's not empowered by a a, a soul-changing grace, then it will be short-lived. If we try to serve others out of our own power, we'll soon see the things that are, are wrong with our brothers and sisters. Right, we'll we'll start saying things like, "Well, you know, I used to help that person, but they they were never very grateful for what I did. He or she never thanked me once for all the stuff I did for them." 
or he or she, they, they, need, they need help less than I do. I need more help than they need. But guys, our attitude in serving others must always be pleasing Christ. Not them or ourselves, but Christ. Regardless of what they do or they don't do, you're not responsible for them. You're responsible for you. And we're called to go and serve selflessly. And we serve our Lord, not the people we're helping. We're serving the Lord. And when our hearts are renewed and we understand this is our purpose, this is our focus, this is who we're actually helping, it changes us. Our attitude must be to please Christ. Because the reality is God is the one we are serving. And when you do that, here's what I found. Your, your attitude will be so much more compassionate. You will be so much more loving when you serve. Not to get something in return, but out of just the gratitude of what Christ has done for you. And this is a powerful passage to, to humble those of us who think, Others should do everything for us while we don't do anything for others. What makes it so powerful is it's heavy theological content that that Paul packs in here. It's powerful because while it teaches teaches what Christ, the Son of God, did for us as wretched sinners, it, it also condemns any of us who think we're above putting ourselves out for another. Selflessness, the selflessness of Jesus, in contrast, is the model for us. When we struggle to serve others or, or they struggle to or, or we struggle to keep serving someone that turns their back on us, it, it's important to ask that question. If, if Christ thought the way we are thinking, would we have ever been saved? And this is a powerful question to, to redirect ourselves from self, selfishness to selflessness. Paul then finishes this passage by reminding us of the result of Jesus' humility in verses 9 through 11. He says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, one of the things that I've seen over the last 25 so years of ministry is that so many of us start off doing so well. We're we're living a life of, of selflessness and we're serving others. We're not just expecting everyone to serve us. But over time, we tend to get discouraged for a multitude of reasons. And this is one of the reasons that one of my life verses has become Galatians 6, 9, where he says, and let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we don't give up. The Lord knew we needed a verse like this because serving others is hard. Dying to yourself, by definition, is hard to do. And let's be honest, I mean, one of the hardest things about serving others is not seeing any of the results of our labor, right? Like when you're parents, like when you're parenting and you see your kid's behavior changing because of your parenting, it encourages you to keep parenting. But after the thousandth time you've said the same thing, it can be a bit discouraging, right? Like we're just over and over and over again having to tell, and nothing is changing. And so that can be very discouraging. And the same thing is true when discipling other people. It, it, it's, you see the same trail that they're going down that leads to destruction. You're like, hey, get off the trail. And they're like, I'm fine. And then two months later, you get that call. Can you help me? I, I've fallen again and there's part of you that's like well you told you you were going to fall why don't you listen but again that's where you have to remind yourself you're no better 
It may look different, but you do the same thing somewhere else in your life. And when you can do that and you can remember that God graciously dusts you off, picks you up, puts you back on the right path over and over and over and over and over again, that grace empowers you. That love empowers you to then help that person get up one more time, put them back on the path. This is one of the main reasons I think people burn out that I, when I talk to different leaders and pastors and, and churches, they just get, they, I, they get so tired, they get so frustrated because they don't see the change that they hope they would see. But I want you to notice, again, the theological argument that even Jesus had to wait until after his earthly life to receive the recognition he so rightly deserved. Why do you think you should be any better than Jesus? Why do you think you're more entitled to this recognition than Jesus, the perfect son of God who lived a sinless life? And even he didn't get the recognition until after this life. This morning, some of you may be here and you're like, you, you've tapped out because, you know, you just didn't feel like you were seeing the results you thought you should see. You weren't getting the recognition that you thought you were getting. Paul puts an exclamation on his argument by saying, even Christ didn't get it here on earth. But the good news is, when you live that selfish life, when you do not grow weary, grow weary in doing well, And you don't give up. Just like Christ, you will be exalted. Let me conclude this morning by just connecting Paul's emotional and theological pleas with some just some practical application for us. Such a rich theological argument that he's making. I think it helps to just kind of have some some things for us to think about. One is what I started with. Preventative prayers. Because here's the thing about a preventative prayer. Every day what you're doing with a preventative prayer is you're starting out with a dependence on God. You're getting up every morning and saying, God, I know my proclivity to do this. And I need your help. I need your spirit to help me to not do that. Right? Do you see that dependence that like before you even start your day, you're saying, God, I need you. I can't do this. I need your spirit to empower me to live a different way of life. So if if we're going to practice humility that leads to unity, we need to be focusing and, and praying preventative prayers when we wake up in the morning. The same thing goes for unity. Lord, I know this person bothers me. Lord, I know this person gets under my skin. Will you change my heart toward them this morning? Will will you change and and help me to to see something or to hear something different so that, that I can focus on them being a person made in the image of God and not my enemy, right? Second, I, I think we need to be reflecting on the gospel regularly. That regular meditation of the gospel helps us maintain a perspective of God's grace and our need for humility. Right When we forget the gospel, when we forget confession and repentance and what God has done for us, then we start to think we've got it all figured out and these people just need to get their acts together. If they would just do what I do, they'd be fine. As if a certain amount of Bible reading and a certain amount of church attendance and a certain amount of giving just automatically makes you good with God. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that makes you right with God through confession and repentance regularly. And when we're daily confessing and repenting, oh God, this is, here I am again. And we're reminded every day of the goodness of the gospel. Then it makes us a much kinder, compassionate gracious group of people 
that promote unity rather than dissension. Third, we need to be serving others. Again, just actively looking for ways to serve and and put others' needs before our own. And I think when we do those things, you'll find yourself, at least it's been my experience, and I I hope it's been yours, that that when you do those things, when you're praying those preventative prayers, you're you're, you're putting your, your dependence on God every morning, you're reflecting on the goodness of the gospel, you're serving others, that that leads to a gratitude. There's a thankfulness that you begin to practice in your life because of God's blessings in your life. Even if you're just aware of it more because you're serving and helping others, you realize what you have that you could not have. Does that make sense? And that leads to a thankfulness of things that you might not even be aware of. Things that you were taking for granted. I encourage you, your friends are in the hospital, go see them. Every time I leave a hospital, I am thankful that I am not in the hospital for whatever reason, right? There's a thankfulness that comes because you know, but by the grace of God, that could be me. Finally, if this is something that you're struggling with, then seek out accountability. Engage some people, maybe your small group, who who can provide some support and accountability in a journey towards humility. Like I said last week, and, and like Paul said last week, the greatest gift to us is us. And we need each other. Because as Hebrew says, the deceitfulness of sin blinds us. And we often can see the sin in everybody else's life but our own. And we need other people who love us, who care about us, to help us to be accountable and to point us back toward the unity that Paul is arguing for here in Philippians. The preventative prayers, gospel reflection, serve others, cultivate gratitude, And find accountability. These are just some practical steps that you can take toward obtaining the unity that that Paul is arguing for in our passage this morning. Let's pray. Father, first, thank you that because of you loving us and sending your son to die for us, this is even possible. Lord, apart from the gospel, we would all just be self-serving people who want and demand our own way. But because you loved us and you sent your son to die for us, we now have the ability and the power to live a new life, empowered by your Holy Spirit, that enables us to die to ourselves and to live as Christ. And what a beautiful picture that Paul paints here in our passage of the links that Jesus went to for us this morning. Father, without the gospel, we would be nothing. We would be hopeless. But because of the gospel, we have so much hope. And I thank you for that this morning. And Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know, that has never experienced the love of God, what I pray this morning would be the morning that they would open up their heart. They would confess their sin, acknowledge their need, their lack, and receive the free gift of salvation. Lord. And Father, for those of us who have received that gift, and perhaps time has gone and we have grown frustrated and tired and maybe even angry and bitter because we haven't seen the results that we think we should have seen. Lord, I pray you would just convict our hearts this morning. Remind us that that even Jesus didn't see the full result until after this life. And help us to confess our, our own 
pride in thinking we should have something that our Savior did not. And Father, help us to follow Jesus' example. An example that led even to death for others. Father, I ask all these things in Jesus' precious name.